Good morning, good afternoon to everyone joining. Uh, my name is Ilhu Kessels. I'm the Executive Director of the Global Center on Cooperative Security, and I'm very pleased to moderate uh, today's event uh, on Global Center's recently released policy brief on far-right far online financing and ways to counter it, which was authored uh, by Jason Blazekas. Uh, in the last decades, uh, there's been a significant increase in attacks that are uh, attributable to violent extremists motivated by racial, ethnic, and anti-authority sentiments. Understanding how the finances connected to these individuals and groups are raised, used, moved, and stored is vitally important to designing strategies to prevent and counter extremist violence. The policy brief examines the online financing and support systems that are associated with these types of individuals and groups uh, in the United States, uh, as well as some of its international linkages, and offers policy solutions to better combat those financial support systems. One of the Global Center's core areas of work is financial integrity and inclusion, where we provide policy analysis and capacity development to support government, private sector, and nonprofit actors on anti money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism measures, while safeguarding civic space, human rights, and access to financial services. As part of this, the Global Center also works to examine the applicability of current frameworks to counter the financing of terrorism on efforts to prevent and disrupt the financing of right wing extremism and hate speech, which is why I'm so very grateful for today's discussion, uh, for the policy brief that Jason has provided uh, and for the interesting discussion that we'll have uh, with our panelists today. Before we start a discussion, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, the event is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube and we will circulate the link to the recording after today's event concludes uh, so you can uh, rewatch it uh, and share it uh, with colleagues and other interested parties. And if you have any technical issues or concerns during a discussion, uh, please use the Q&A function to send a private message uh, to one of the Global Center team members uh, who will do their best uh, to support you. Now, we're delighted that so many of you are able to join us today, and we look forward to today's discussion. Uh, and we'll now introduce uh, the wonderful panelists that we have with us here. So joining us, of course, first and foremost is Jason Blazekas. He is a professor of practice uh, and director of the Center on Terrorism, Extremism, and Counterterrorism. Uh, at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey, as well as a senior advisor uh, to the Sufan Group. Um, among several positions at the US Department of State, Jason has also served from 2008 to 2018 as Director of Counterterrorism Finance and Designations Office in the State Department's Bureau of Counterterrorism and Countering Violent Extremism, and is currently working uh, on a book on terrorism financing. Our second panelist is uh, Mary McCourt, who serves as Executive Director at the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection, uh, is a visiting professor of law at Georgetown University's Law Center and advisory council member of the Global Center. She was the acting assistant attorney general for national security at the US Department of Justice from 2016 to 2017 and principal deputy assistant attorney general for the national security division from 2014 to 2016. And previously, Mary was an assistant US attorney for nearly 20 years at the US attorney's office for the District of Columbia. And then thirdly, we have uh, Karen Rotz joining us, as we, uh, who serves as the director of the Amalgamated Bank Foundation's Hate is Not Charitable campaign. And this campaign calls for the philanthropic sector to defund charitable organizations promoting hate. She most recently served as executive director of the Jewish Community Action, a 26-year-old nonprofit organizi organizing Minnesota's Jewish community for racial and economic justice. And on staff there since 2004, she worked in campaigns for immigrants and workers' rights and played a key role in leading uh, GCA's work to pass marriage equality in Minnesota in 2012. As executive director, Karen grew the organization, built on ongoing campaigns for affordable housing, criminal justice reform, and launched a program to work statewide with other progressives to build a shared analysis of anti-Semitism and white nationalism. I thank the three of you for, for joining us today and I look forward to, uh, to our discussion. Firstly, I'm going to turn over to the author of the policy brief, Jason Blazekas, for an overview of the principal findings and the recommendations of this brief that you can find online uh, at www.globalcenter.org um, for uh, your viewing. Jason, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Elko. It's a great pleasure to be here today with you and my esteemed panelists. I want to spend the next 10 to 15 minutes or so to go over some of the key findings related to far-right online financing. The brief, which I hope you've had a chance to read or will read soon, examines the financing and online support systems that racist and ethnically motivated violent extremists utilize. 
I want to emphasize up front that while this paper examines online financing related to ethnically motivated extremists and anti-government actors, that's not to say that individuals within these milieus do not avail themselves of traditional forms of financing that are analog in orientation. They certainly do. Bank robberies, extortion, music concerts, fight clubs, charitable events held in the real world remain important forms of financing for racist actors. Now, the briefing paper, it's about 10 pages long, looks at how cryptocurrency, non-fungible tokens or NFTs, and crowdsourcing in online merchandise spaces have been or can be utilized by violent extremists within the radical right. In particular, the decentralized nature of cryptocurrency and NFTs hold great allure to those within racist communities. But I want first to take a step back in time to provide some context as to why decentralized systems of exchange may be intriguing to radical right-wing actors. In the early 1990s, for example, there was an individual by the name of Louis Beam, who's a white supremacist associated with a array of uh, far-right groups like the KKK. And he discussed in those circles the importance of this concept of leaderless resistance. Essentially, Beam was talking about this concept of non-organizationally driven activities, violent activities that focus on the white supremacist enemies. And when it comes to thinking about the radical right in financing today, I believe this push towards decentralized financing is a natural corollary to some of the theories advocated for by Lewis Beam. Now, we've seen these echoes in a more contemporary setting. Richard Spencer, as you may know, discussed how Bitcoin would become the currency of the alt-right movement. This idea of skepticism regarding centralization of the financial system is in keeping with Beam's theories, but is also noteworthy because it fits with other elements within radical right thinking, chiefly those related to conspiracy theories and anti-Semitism. There are conspiracists within the far right that, for example, believe that the formal financial system is rigged and controlled by the Jewish population. Jewish people within these circles are seen as the other. As such, breaking away from this perceived power structure, power that controls the levers of the financial sector, in particular banking institutions, has become important with these right-wing actors. Cryptocurrency and NFTs provide a theoretical avenue for escape by these actors that are on the fringes of society. But I want to be clear here also that there are many non-far-right actors who own cryptocurrency and non-fungible tokens, and that these individuals do not engage in extremist activities. So that's an important caveat. Now, that caveat aside, let's go back to the elements of the paper. In practical terms, the paper discusses how one neo-Nazi, an individual by the name of Andrew Anglin, has specifically requested financial support for running his neo-Nazi propaganda publication known as the Daily Stormer. Anglin wanted to receive and only received cryptocurrency from financial backers and has made millions of dollars in crypto donations. Another example related to large cryptocurrency donations received by a white supremacist is that of a donation received by an individual by the name of Nick Fuentes. Fuentes received a donation from a French national with far right leanings. And interestingly, that donation landed in Fuentes' virtual wallet in the lead up to the January 6th insurrection. Uh, some of this work has been detailed in really well by a group called Chainalysis, um, a group uh, that does a lot of work in the blockchain forensic space. But we should also keep in mind regarding Fuentes, he was one of the primary architects of the January 6th insurrection. Now, moving perhaps to the more esoteric space, the non-fungible token space, the paper goes into detail on how websites like OpenSea and Rarible are awash in NFTs being sold that glorify right-wing actors such as Adolf Hitler. For those of you that aren't familiar with NFTs, NFTs are essentially digital art that is bought and sold for cryptocurrency. Now, since writing and publishing this paper, um, which came out in August, it would become later known that a US designated terrorist group by the name of the Russian Imperial Movement actually minted NFTs for sale over the OpenSea platform. Now, the minting of the NFT, according to a company called Caron, K-H-A-R-O-N, um, a company that identified RIM being engaged in this NFT activity, 
um, really, it became the first known instance of a designated terrorist group that tried to benefit from the sale of an NFT. You know, since then, we've seen ISIS, for instance, engage in NFT related activity as well, or ISIS sympathizers. But RIM, the Russian imperial movement, was the first group to actually engage in this space. That's not in the paper, unfortunately, because this became something we became aware of after um, the paper's publication. Now, finally, the paper does go into detail also about how groups try to profit by selling their wares and their ideas in online spaces. And crowdfunding has been a very important component of this. Um, the use of Patreon, Kickstarter, and GoFundMe um, websites have been important tools for radical right-wing actors to secure financing from sympathetic audiences. While some of those crowdfunding sites have been locking out racially and ethnically motivated extremists, from using their services, new crowdfunding sites have catered specifically to those types of communities. And after the January 6th insurrection, one in particular, Give Some Go, um, was uh, highlighted by journalists as being an important crowdfunding source for individuals who were trying to fund their travel to Washington, D.C. on January 6th. Now, moving along, online market spaces are also powerful sources of income for racially and ethnically motivated actors because they allow the seller to reach people that aren't within their local community. Very simply, online platforms expand the reach and thus the possibility of increasing the volume of sales. The paper details how radical right-wing actors have leveraged crowdfunding and marketplaces to build their coffers. In addition, these sources of online financing among radical right actors, the paper also tries to offer some solutions on how to counter these financial activities. First, let me say that countering these types of licit or legal avenues is very difficult. Yet one of the best mechanisms to do so is by pursuing legal action against racist actors or ethnically motivated actors who have engaged in illegal behavior. And that behavior um, often manifests in violence, um, but that violence has to be funded and those activities have to be funded somehow. Um, and those financial activities can be um, taken action against vis-a-vis -vis legal pursuits. And I think Mary McCord, um, one of the panelists today, is going to speak very authoritarily about some of the legal strategies that entities um, and individuals can pursue in this space. But first, I want to talk about a couple of the highlights from the paper related to legal action. The paper highlights civil judgments that have been made against radical right-wing actors, such as a $26 million plaintiffs um, were awarded because of violent actions of individuals who planned the so-called Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. The paper also talks about a $14 million judgment that Tanya Gersh won against Andrew Anglin, the previously mentioned individual who runs the Daily Stormer. He engaged in a cyberbullying campaign against her that had real world impact. Now these judgments though are largely unsatisfied. It is one thing to win legal action, but another to collect on the actual judgment itself. That's why the paper recommends that civil society, nonprofits, lawyers, and governmental experts in asset seizure and forfeiture, as well as cryptocurrency forensic companies, should consider creating essentially asset recovery teams to follow the civil court judgments against right-wing violent extremists. And these teams could specialize in tracing and seizing cryptocurrency, among other things. So the combination of lawsuits and asset forfeiture may be among the best ways to counter right-wing violent extremism. And I'm pleased to say since writing this paper in August that some of this work, the formation of cells to collect judgments along the lines I just described is happening thanks to some of the work that came out of the Eradicate Hate Global Summit um, that has been convened these past two years and most recently in September of this year in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Now, another recommendation the paper puts forward is the need for the United States government to sanction overseas racially and ethnically motivated extremist groups and individuals who meet existing legal criteria for designation. To this day, only one such group is designated pursuant to US law, and that is the Russian Imperial Movement, a group designated by the US Department of State pursuant to Executive Order 13224. Simply put, more groups likely meet the legal criteria for designation. And I think it's high time that state and treasury departments do more in this space but we also have to recognize at the same time that these policymaking departments can't do that work unless they have adequate information, information that can be only provided by the United States intelligence community, 
other countries, the academic community, or the private sector. While more needs to be done to regulate cryptocurrency and NFT spaces, I am actually somewhat cautiously optimistic that the new so-called travel rule will lead to an expansion of reporting requirements for domestic virtual currency transactions of $3,000 or more and international transactions at a lower level. While the cryptocurrency uh, industry does not like this, I think it is absolutely necessary. Firms that exist in the cryptocurrency space aren't as mature in building out their compliance sections that are dedicated to fighting money laundering and terrorism financing as banking institutions are, which have been doing this since the 1970s. But it's time for these firms, if crypto is going to remain a thing, to do this. Otherwise, I think the shelf life of cryptocurrency is going to be shortened. Another recommendation of the paper is to reconstitute the Federal Bureau of Investigation's Terrorist Financing and Operations Section, TFOS for sure. I will say that when I worked in the US government, I had the pleasure of working with FBI agents and analysts for nearly 20 years who were part of TFOS and having a centralized node within the FBI that is dedicated to fighting terrorist financing is critically important. Sadly, TFOS was shuttered in 2019. I think it's time to bring back TFOS to expand its mission as well so that it prioritizes the collection of information related to illicit activities of racially and ethnically motivated violent extremists. Now, finally, the paper points to the need for social media companies to do their part in countering the hate that is spread online. There is little disagreement, I think, amongst experts that algorithms have actually developed, been developed by these companies that have had an actually important role in radicalizing individuals. So holding companies accountable, especially social media ones, is important. And to me, this is a supply and demand issue. Social media companies have created a new supply of radicalized individuals that terrorist financiers can tap into. As such, new laws and civil society responses are necessary to hold companies accountable for actions that have created the underlying environment to spread hate and for the flow of finance to spread along with it. And lastly, I'm very concerned about violence in the wake of the midterm elections. I know so far, thankfully, we haven't seen anything along these lines, but the same ingredients that we saw in the aftermath of some of the more recent elections remain present today. And January 6th happened multiple months, of course, after the 2020 um, election. And those ingredients that are present today really are this distrust of democratic institutions, particularly amongst individuals on the very far right side of the spectrum, the spread of mis- and disinformation, and the proliferation of conspiracy theories. Now, if violence is going to occur, it has to be bankrolled somehow. And sadly, I think those in governmental positions that are in positions to influence things are in a poor position, especially as it relates to the kinds of actors who may be positioning themselves to carry out election-related violence. Simply put, I think a lot of the legal tools that might be available to them to counter these activities still don't exist. But I do think some of the papers of the paper, uh, the recommendations of the paper remain relevant today. And I think they're attainable as well. Whether they stop imminent acts of violence is another matter. The recommendations of the paper, I think, are designed for achieving long-term successes. And whether or not we get there in time is another matter. Um, so that concludes, Elko, my formal remarks regarding the uh, paper. Um, obviously, the paper goes into much more detail um, than I went over just now and would really um, hope that folks that are on today will take a look at the paper as well. Thank you, Elko. Thanks so much, Jason, uh, for providing such a comprehensive overview of the core analysis and the principal findings of, uh, of the paper. Um, well, let me use this opportunity to turn to, to Mary, Mary McCord, the Executive Director for the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection um, at Georgetown. Um, Mary. Can you share some reflections on the policy brief, on, on Jason's findings, uh, and in particular around the finan financing sources uh, for far-right violent extremists? Uh, and of course, particularly also keen to hear um, uh, and, uh, some insights and information um, that you can provide in related litigation work uh, that you have with the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection. Mary. Thank you, Elko, and thank you for uh, hosting this webinar. I mean, we're really at a kind of a critical time period here, just one day after the midterms. Um, uh, and as 
Jason said they yesterday the voting in the U.S. did uh, go quite smoothly with very limited incidents of political violence. And I think it remains to be seen what will happen during the tabulation of the votes. And largely that will depend on what those um, who have been involved in election denial, denying the results of the 2020 election, it will largely depend on whether, you know, those who do not prevail in their um, in their races, whether they accept the results or whether they um, deny those results. Uh, sort of spinning off of some things that Jason said, I think there are three real challenges when it comes to trying to counter the financing of far-right extremism and terrorism in the U.S. And first is that much of the big, big-time dollars, the real funding, is going into disinformation and misinformation. Disinformation being the deliberately false uh, narratives that are promulgated by different organizations. Um, uh, Jason mentioned Daily Stormer as one that has been a platform for all kinds of anti-Semitic, racist, white supremacist um, content for many years now and was a, is a main, was a main driver behind the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville back in 2017, and those who participated in it had oftentimes consumed much content from Daily Stormer. But then we also have organizations like True the Vote, which is an organization that um, is has been behind much of the false narrative about the 2020 election. Uh, they have promoted and funded the 2000 Mules film, which is a film that purports to show that there was massive fraud in the 2020 election through the harvesting of fake ballots by mules who brought those to ballot drop boxes. And all of this disinformation, unfortunately, unless it actually crosses the line into uh, concrete and specific threats of violence or um, inciting violence or conspiring to commit violence is protected by the First Amendment. So it's uh, so first point, and I'll come back to this, is most of the funding, the big time funding is funding of disinformation that's hard for us to get to because of the First Amendment. The second is those who actually engaged in the most violent acts of terrorism in the U.S., the the domestic extremists whose whose terrorist acts are motivated by either anti-government extremism or racist extremism, white supremacist extremism, um, they're often lone actors who are not funded by or really even officially associated with either organizations spreading disinformation or organizations that are out, you know, actively on the ground engaging in demonstrations, protests, what have you. Um, uh, you know, either anti-government or uh, white nationalist, white supremacist types of demonstrations. They're often um, sole actors. And then the third problem is that organizations that do promote disinformation are often short-lived. Their conduct, some of their conduct is pr protected by the First Amendment, and they often have tax exempt status. And we'll come back to that. So just to, to, to go back to the disinformation uh, point. You know, not all terrorism uh, in, in the U.S. is, um, I mean, not everything that is motivated by extremism in the U.S. is terrorism. Terrorism is defined in the U.S. code as a crime of violence um, that is done to, intended to intimidate or coerce a civilian population or to influence the policy of government through intimidation or coercion. But much of what we see right now in the U.S. is in voter intimidation, intimidation of our elected officials, whether at the very, you know, uh, local level, county officials, county school board members, local election officials, up to state election officials, teachers, um, public health officials, right? These are people who have been experiencing threats, harassment, and intimidation, types of political violence that often fall short of actual criminal activity, much less actual violent criminal activity, but nevertheless are, are toxic to our democracy in the US. And many of this, and much of this dis disinformation is also the basis for the anti-democracy efforts that we see going on, whether it is efforts to change rules about elections uh, in ways that are very disenfranchising to voters or intimidating to voters or ways to entrench um, single party rule in the states through extreme pro 
uh, political gerrymandering, all of these things. Right now, we've seen a collapse of sort of the disinformation that fuels political violence, the same disinformation that fueled the insurrection at the US Capitol on January 6th is also fueling these anti-democracy efforts. But many of the organizations, in fact, it is a it's a, it's an actual strategy that we've seen. We've seen far right platform Gab earlier this spring be very clear about the strategy, which is county over country. Capture your county, maybe a few, and then your state. What we need is a decentralized Christian nationalist. Um, political movement. And that's what we've seen in the aftermath of January 6th, some of the sort of national organizations, Three Percenters National, um, Proud Boys National, disbanded in favor of uh, local chapters and state chapters. And then we've seen, as I was just mentioning, you know, attacks and uh, intimidation and threats and harassment at that very local level. And so it's much harder to combat whether you're talking about directly combating it or when you're trying to drill down into the financing of it. So um, the, many of the groups that are promoting most the disinformation that fuels political violence in the US also know enough to go right up to the line, but not to cross it into criminal activity. So they will, because they know that their rhetoric is going to be pr pr um, protected by the First Amendment, and they will stop just short of openly advocating violence. But we know, um, and this is the, the second problem, that individuals who do go ahead and engage in terrorist acts, the shooter in El Paso, Texas a few years ago, the shooter at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh a few years ago, so many different um, uh actors who have engaged much more recently, the shooters in Buffalo and Uvalde, for example, they were radicalized by disinformation online, much as people were radicalized by the disinformation of ISIS back in 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, and even up till today. Um, they were radicalized online, but they're not directly sponsored oftentimes by any uh, organizations who have a, any type of structure or any type of funding. Um, so some of the things there uh, that, um, you know, people like Jason and myself and others have also recommended sometimes to Congress when they look into this is better reporting suspicious uh, activity reports from banks, right? For example, the shooter in Las Vegas a few years ago had purchased multiple firearms in a very short period of time right before his attack. And that's the kind of thing that hadn't really gotten passed to authorities who might have been able to use that to look into it. So sometimes those types of transactions where you're seeing the accumulation of weapons, um, particularly firearms in the U.S., which are the most common tool of committing terrorist acts, that could be a useful way to get at at least some of these individuals who aren't receiving financing from you know, bigger organizations or bigger funders. And then the third issue, which really comes up on uh, bumps, up, bumps up against the litigation that my organization has been involved in, is organizations that do promote disinformation here that certainly uh, do show up on the ground. Charlottesville back in 2017 was a major example of uh, white nationalist organizations, anti-government, private, unlawful militias, um, conspiracy theorists, and others coming out of that virtual space into that phys physical space on the ground in Charlottesville, ostensibly to be engaging in a First Amendment protest, but we know they really were intending to pr provoke counter protesters into really starting street battles um, and then be able to respond violently and invoke their uh, self-defense, their, their rights to self-defense in, in any kind of defense of criminal uh, charges. So there we've seen think, you know groups like um, uh, QAnon, anti-government extremists, et cetera, coming together, not only in Charlottesville, but elsewhere, including at the, on the attack at the U.S. Capitol. Now, just as Jason was mentioning, um, well, let me back up a little bit. My organization now, ICAP at Georgetown University, we are a constitutional impact litigation shop. Um, and so after Charlottesville, what we did is we looked around to say, well, what, what, what could we do to prevent a repeat of what happened in Charlottesville? Because even though the speech might have been protected, there was violence here. There was 
usurpation of law enforcement functions by private unlawful militias who were geared up in total military gear with assault style rifles, flak jackets, helmets, boots, who, you know, uh, deployed themselves in into uh, taking up a perimeter around the area of the of the rally and purporting to actually, you know, engage in law enforcement functions, telling people where to go and what to do and protecting the protesters against violence from counter protesters. Now, doing so raised the tension markedly because they were there with no authority whatsoever, uh, arrogating onto themselves when and under what circumstances that they would deploy that, that lethal force. So what we did in Charlottesville, which was a little different than the case that Jason mentioned, which was a case about suing for money damages for the injuries caused there. And there were substantial injuries. Heather Heyer was killed by a white nationalist who ran into her with her, his car. Many others were seriously injured. They have serious med medical bills uh, and they did obtain a judgment of, of a enormous judgment of $26 million against many of the white nationalists who participated in that rally. My organization brought a lawsuit as well, but it was a different lawsuit and it wasn't about money. It was a lawsuit based on state anti-militia laws and anti-paramilitary activity laws. And it was a lawsuit primarily to just not get money, but to prevent through court orders, a repeat of that same activity. And we were successful in that lawsuit. Uh, and we obtained court orders against 23 different white supremacist and anti-government militia groups that prevent them permanently, them, their leaders, their members, their officers, and their successor organizations, so they can't just change names tomorrow and, and repeat the conduct, prevents them from returning to Charlottesville in groups of two or more while armed with anything that for use as a weapon, acting in concert uh, while armed during any protest, rally, demonstration, and march or March. We've recently um, similarly partnered with the district attorney in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico in bringing a similar case against an unlawful private militia there that similarly deployed in 2020 during a racial justice demonstration. Again, usurping long law enforcement functions dressed in full military kits, you know, inserting themselves between protesters and counter protesters and raising the tensions and a shooting did result there. Um, not by one of the militia members, but by somebody else who was, you know, agitated and riled up by their presence. We did successfully just last month obtained a court ordered injunctive relief against that unlawful militia organization. So there are tools, of course, to prevent some of this activity when you can focus in on the activity that's not protected by the First Amendment, and I should mention also not protected by the Second Amendment, which does not authorize private paramilitary organizations. The Supreme Court's been clear about that for over 130 years, uh, back dating back to a case in 1886, reiterated in 2008, and not undermined by the Supreme Court's most recent Second Amendment ruling. So we can we can use these legal tools to go after the conduct instead of the viewpoint or the content of the speech, which can be effective. But that still doesn't get at the financing issue. And last couple points I'll make um, is that what we've seen in our litigation against some of these anti government, uh, private paramilitary organizations and white supremacist organizations is they do really make use of the online sources that Jason was mentioning. We've seen their websites will promote their philanthropic, you know, they will rebrand themselves on the websites often as patriot organizations who are engaged in community preparedness, or they are engaged in helping with disaster recovery after natural disasters, things like that. So they'll brand themselves, sort of cover themselves in the flag and patriotism, often with tax exempt status from the U.S. government as well as state governments and openly fundraise on their websites. Now, this is something we can come back to later because this use of tax exempt status is oftentimes, I think, based on real fraud about what these organizations do. So we've seen, for example, organizations, paramilitary organizations who have decamped to the southern border 
unlawfully detaining migrants and holding them uh, for to turn over to the Customs and Border Patrol, funding on that activity and having tax exempt status when everything they're doing is completely unlawful. They have no authority to be detaining migrants at the border. They're completely unauthorized organizations, um, but they will sh they will shroud what they're doing in this cloak of patriotism and openly raise funds online. They will uh, they will seek membership dues. Um, that fund their activity. They will engage in podcasts and videos to promote themselves and seek funding. They will use crowdfunding websites, as Jason mentioned. Um, and we see product sales and training. So paraphernalia, t-shirts, caps, et cetera, but also training. Um, Oath Keepers, uh, Minutemen, many others have, you know, engaged in various different trainings they will take from state to state in paramilitary techniques, paramilitary tactic, tactics, all for money. So these are all areas where they're getting money, but they're not getting, you know, and, and it adds up, but oftentimes it's by sort of small dollar donations. And what we see many times is the, is the, is the recruitment of, and this is something to be honest that we saw, we've seen with ISIS as well. If you can't come join us, if you can't deploy on the ground, send us some money. And there are a lot of people in the U.S. who say, "Well, I, I'm not going to get out there, um, and I'm not going to take up arms, but I will send money to others to do it." Uh, but those are coming from such diverse sources; it's hard to tackle from a financing perspective. We also see that oftentimes these organizations dissolve after they're sued. We've seen that in both of in 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 our cases, uh, in Charlottesville, after litigation was brought, after the rally resulted in deaths and in death and injury, um, some of the organizations that were most involved, the Traditionalist Workers Party, the National Socialist Movement, they imploded and broke up or went under new leadership. So it can be hard to trace the money when you have organizations that are so transient. Um, and oftentimes uh, when it comes to litigation, because they don't have any funding, they're not able to afford attorneys. Many times attorneys will not um, represent them or when they do, they're pretty unethical attorneys. We see then that even if you, that they can make a mockery of litigation, even if they, if you're able to get attorney's fees awards against them, which we were in New Mexico, they don't have any money to pay those awards. And if you get judgments against them, as Jason was indicating, there's no ability for them to pay those judgments. Um, asset forfeiture, I agree with Jason, is something that I think is really necessary. And one issue that we, that I've been talking a lot about, have testified um, on Capitol Hill about, and I'm working with Congress member Jamie Raskin on, is a, a statute, you know, we already have a lot of state anti-militia statutes and anti-paramilitary statutes, but those are criminal statutes. And so we need civil tools that include forfeiture to dismantle some of these paramilitary groups and to, um, and to seize what assets they might have, which might be in the form of firearms and other weapons and paramilitary uh, gear. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much, uh, Mary, for a very expansive overview of the, the various groups and actions that fall within this sort of broader far-right milieu, uh, ways that they fundraise uh, and recruit, and some of the litigation pathways uh, that have been uh, been successful. And we will come back to some of those, those issues uh, later on in the conversation, including legal definitional issues, uh, as well as the international components uh, of, this, of this discussion. I would also want to thank those participants that are uh, providing very insightful questions in the Q&A. We will try and get to some of those uh, through our discussion and encourage others uh, to also uh, share their questions um, in, uh, via the Q&A function uh, on, uh, on Zoom. Uh, Jason, I'm going to turn back to you after this uh, expansive overview by Mary to provide perhaps a little bit more insight into the responsibilities of various stakeholders uh, in identifying, preventing, and countering the financing of far-right violence. Could you give us a sense of the kind of measures that can and should be taken by governments on the one hand, uh, perhaps by the private sector, financial institutions, tech uh, technology companies, uh, social media companies, uh, to, to help identify and counter uh, far-right uh, far -right financing? Jason. Uh, thank you, Elko. Yeah, on that question, on investigation specifically, for instance, that was in the purview of uh, the government, well, one point I just would want to reemphasize from the uh, initial intervention is the need to reconstitute uh, the terrorism finance and operations section within the FBI. I think that's an important first step to take. Um, but I don't want to belabor that point um, 
I think there are things that are being done in the context of investigations that are very positive that we can point to as well. Uh, the uh, FBI and Department of Homeland Security last week, I don't know if people saw this, um, actually issued some really good stats finally uh, regarding some domestic extremist investigations, um, providing us uh, specific numbers. And there has been a, a drastic increase in the kinds of investigations the FBI is pursuing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, domestic extremists. I think um, having a, the terrorist finance operations section um, to help follow the money in the context of those investigations would be another really great way to amplify some of this excellent work that's being done by the FBI in terms of uh, investigation. So that's one positive development that the uh, current administration has been pursuing. Um, the second point I want to make, and this I think touches on some of the points Mary has made, it also tracks back to um, a paper I wrote in 2019 for Talking Points Memo, and this also is in, in the investigative government space, in that there are a large number of far-right actors who have historically taken advantage of tax-exempt status to bypass the paying of taxes. And this isn't new, really. This is a long history of radical right-wing groups doing what they can to avoid paying taxes. You know, groups like Posse Comitatus in the 1970s, for instance, was particularly adept at deploying tactics that allowed the group to circumvent IRS tax provisions. And this actually resulted in the IRS um, in creating a special team to counter tax evasion tactics deployed by groups like Posse Comitatus. Uh, so that that is something I, I would love to see the IRS be able to do. Sadly, the IRS is a, political, a politicized institution. Um, its capabilities to track tax evasion and inappropriate tax exempt status cases has been significantly diminished over the last decade. Um, so I really do think the administration needs to put more resources into the IRS to do some of that work like they were doing in the 1970s. And in defense of the current administration, they actually have um, try to push forward um, the creation of uh, new positions within the Internal Revenue Service to do investigations. But you know, reading the papers, there's a lot of significant blowback um, in the Biden administration for trying to pursue those avenues. Um, simply put, I think it's going to be important for the IRS to get more resources like they had in the 1970s so they can focus on hate groups Someone that, I, I apologize, someone was at the doorbell, <laughs> uh, inappropriately uh, using tax exemptions. Um, I, I think this work is very important. On the intelligence front, which is also within the purview of, of government, I've written for a number of publications like The Hill, how vitally important intelligence is for collecting information regarding overseas actors who may have ties with domestic groups here in the United States. And intelligence is very important, as I alluded to very briefly in the first intervention, um, for the actual crafting of sanctions by the state and treasury departments. Without the underlying intelligence, those administrative records and those evidentiaries that are so vitally important for the actual creation of a designation against a far-right actor like the Russian imperial movement um, becomes very difficult. So um, the last 20 years, there's no denying that there has been a focus in terms of the intelligence collection apparatus for the United States, focusing on groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and, and the so-called uh, Salafi jihadist threat, um, and moving intelligence resources and collection priorities and essentially elevating those priorities is very difficult to do within the U.S. government. As, as Mary probably can attest to as someone who's been in the inside like me, that takes a lot of time. Um, so I do believe that there is this pivot that is underway to collect more information. And I hope with the collection of that additional information, we'll see the pursuit of more sanctions, uh, perhaps you know intelligence sharing between the U.S. government and other partners that can help with investigations, um, amongst other things. Um, on the private sector, this is a really important question. Um, the private sector has an important role, especially social media companies, to fulfill their own trust and safety guidelines. Um, they have an obligation to remove content that is hateful in orientation. Um, they have a, a, an obligation to remove dis and misinformation because that is against many of the internal trust and safety guidelines that essentially are operating um, the platforms. Um, they have an obligation to remove monetization of their platforms that actors have leveraged in the past. Um, they are important in the context of developing um, procedures and protocols to remove content associated with hateful or terrorist groups. In some cases, quite frankly, some of these organizations have done perhaps even a better job than the government in labeling far-right actors. You know, Meta, for instance, gets a lot of flack, and a lot of it's earned 
But Meta's list of dangerous orgs that are banned from the Meta platform, Facebook um, and Instagram, uh, they are much more significant in scale in the number of organizations than the US government has on its terrorist list of radical right-wing actors like the Russian Imperial Movement, which is just one, right? So these organizations have an important role to play. Um, in terms of financial institutions, I wrote a paper back in 2019 um, for the, the Sufan Center on the, the expansion of transnational right-wing actors, um, specifically white supremacist groups. Um, and financial institutions have a difficult time perhaps relative to taking action against designated groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS because there are, aren't designations on the books for various reasons, um, much of which relates to the inability of the US government to designate domestic groups, for instance, for first or second amendment reasons or um, assembly um, reasons, amongst other important reasons, um, is this idea that financial institutions perhaps don't have that leverage because the sanctions don't exist, but financial institutions do have a role in understanding how radical right-wing actors may be transferring funds in coded ways um, and just to give you one example that I, I wrote about in 2019, um, and it's not terribly illuminating now, I hope, but um, you know, if you see transactions between actors using constantly, for instance, certain kinds of numbers, like the number 88, for instance, um, that could be a signal um, because it's essentially representative of the eighth letter of the alphabet, um, which is H. Um, so HH essentially meaning Heil Hitler. Um, that could be a signal that there are right-wing actors who are transferring funds to one another. And I think this basic kind of due diligence financial institutions can do could alert them to the kinds of behavior that's essentially being utilized by right-wing actors over their platform. Um, and I think there's reputational risk challenges if they don't take action. And that's just one very simple example of where I think financial institutions can do more. Mary mentioned another, I think, um, upping the, the STRs, uh, specifically in the wake of the Vegas uh, shooting from, uh, I, I think it was 2012, 2013 time period. I, I think that's very important as well. So um, I'll, I'll pause there, um, uh, Elko. Thank you for that question. Thanks so much, Jason. Um, at this point, I'd like to bring Karen, Karen Rods into the conversation, the director of Amalgamated Banks Foundation's uh, Hate is Not Charitable campaign. Uh, Karen, as, as one of the participants noted in the Q&A, uh, Jason's report specifically focuses on the methods that far-right individuals and entities have been using to mobilize funds online, including e-commerce, uh, cryptocurrency, crowdfunding. But at the onset of this conversation, you know, Jason rightfully indicated that, of course, they use traditional financial systems um, as well. Um, of course, recognizing that you work for Amalgamated's foundation, not the bank, I did want to ask about your personal perspective on the extent that uh, the far right uses conventional uh, financial institutions, financial me uh, means to mobilize funds, or what banks can do to identify and prevent this type of uh, type of financing. Sure, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I do bring a small amount of good news from Minnesota, where last night, um, a state senator who was a member of the Oath Keepers uh, was defeated by a public school teacher. Um, so some good news. Um, so yeah, as you said, um, Elko, I you know I work for the Charitable Foundation, which is connected to but separate uh, and much much younger than Amalgamated Bank. Um, so uh, so I can talk about the bank um, and what banks can do from from my perspective. Um, uh, speaking for the foundation, I think we'll get to some of those those questions later on. Um, and so I would say that in terms of what banks can do is to look at questions regarding far right financing, um, rather than the values based perspective that the foundation will use from a, a risk management and risk mitigation perspective. Um, a challenge um, that banks might face in this, you know, and Jason has written about this, but banks are going to rely on guidance from groups like the Financial Action Task Force, who provides insights into how organizations operate um, and on whom, you know, financial institutions, they, that's who they can rely on for guidance. And as long as those groups are failing to prioritize domestic threats, that's our, banks are just going to be less knowledgeable about um, the right wing methods to accrue and move money. And the other challenge um, that Jason addressed in, in his policy brief is that many of the far right groups are just simply avoiding banks, um, either because of their anti government perspective or just a very basic belief in anti Semitic conspiracy theories. Um, so, a question that banks could be asking is given the tools that they have, what is the responsibility and opportunity for a financial institution that's playing a role in the financing up the food chain? 
One thing and one area that both of the other speakers have touched on is identifying and reporting suspicious associated activities um, rather than ideologies or groups. Um, and that's both on an individual level and, and in some system, systems change. And I'll just give you an example of both. Um, so I'll show you, I'll highlight um, how Amalgamated Bank has addressed that responsibility, um, both individually and from a systems change perspective, specifically in the area of firearms, um, which, which both of our panelists have mentioned. So first off, and this is pretty basic, um, you know, the bank itself has a longstanding policy of not lending to firearms manufacturers or gun sellers. Um, the bank doesn't maintain banking relationships with businesses involved in gun sales. Um, Amalgamated was the first banking organization to implement procedures to ensure that all commercial clients um, existing and new adhere to the every town's gun safety codes of conduct. That was in 2018. Um, and then the bank's own assets are not invested in uh, the three publicly traded firearms manufacturers, which is Smith & Wesson, Vista Outdoor, and St uh, Sturm Ruger. Um, and they offer funds to institutional and individual clients that screen out investments in firearm manufacturing companies. Um, but, but I really want to um, highlight an, a very recent win um, in how the bank was able to actually impact systems change. Um, and Mary really teed this up. Um, so Amalgamated actually has uh, led some work that uh, we had a big victory last, I was going to say last month, but it's November now. Um, the bank had a big victory in September um, when the bank petitioned, and they had been petitioning the international standards organizations for several years. Um, this was, I believe, our third bite at this apple. Um, and the ISO regulates the, uh, the codes that credit card companies use to track purchases. Um, purchases have a unique code, um, a normal and accepted practice. So if you go buy groceries or if you go buy gas, your credit card company tags your purchase with a category and a code. There is even a code for shoe shines. Um, I don't know the last time anybody on this call got a shoe shine, but credit card companies have a code for shoe shines, nothing for firearms or ammunition. Um, although we know that some of the nation's worst mass shootings like Aurora and San Bernardino and Pulse in Orlando all involved electronic credit card payments. Um, credit card companies already have rules to stop fraud and human tracking, trafficking. So the, so, so the ask of the ISO here, we believe was very common sense. Um, and we did actually win. Um, in September, the uh, ISO agreed to implement codes for, uh, for guns and ammunition. Um, and it means that the same rules that apply to fraud and human trafficking will apply to guns, which will make it easier to flag activities like stockpiling um, and will be able to stop um, hopefully curb mass shootings. Also illegal firearms related activity like straw purchasing. Um, and so, so by being able to flag large purchases of firearms and ammunition, hopefully we'll be able to flag act activities, if not the groups themselves. Um, so there are steps that financial institutions can, and I would absolutely argue should take to curb the flow of money to the groups. And also um, the big opportunity seems to be in specifically targeting the violent activities associated with them. Thank you, Karen. Um, let me pass it back to Jason and, and touch upon one of the elements that, that both Karen and, and Mary um, uh, indicated and that, that some of these international connections, uh, the linkages between uh, US uh, domestic groups and individuals um, as well as uh, with transnational groups or international groups. And of course, specifically um, the financial connections between the two, both finances leaving the US, going to those groups um, and financing uh, coming from outside of the US. Uh, into um, uh, into this uh, this this country, does this do, what kind and what is the extent of of this connection, and um, does this provide only obstacles or are there some opportunities in here as well? Uh, great question and um, an issue that we perhaps didn't explore quite enough in the context of the briefing it, it, itself. But I will say that there are clear linkages between far right actors from the United States and those that are based overseas. It is absolutely an international movement. Um, just a, a few examples to, to set the stage on this. Uh, there's an individual by the name of Robert Rundo based in, in Los Angeles, although he's on the lam right now in, in Europe. He's raised a lot of money um, in the past by organizing fight clubs and events um, overseas um, in places like Ukraine, working with other sympathetic white supremacist organizations. Um, another example, um, and Mary mentioned him um, in her remarks, uh, individual who used to be head of the Traditionalist Workers Party, 
um, an American uh, neo-Nazi by the name of Matthew Heimbach. Um, he is one of the organizers of the Unite the Right rally. He has had very uh, specific kinds of connections with the Russian imperial movement. Um, again, this US designated group, those relations predate Russian imperial movement's designation, but um, a, a flow of uh, individuals between the United States and, and Russia, essentially learning um, from, from one another. So you know, with that travel, obviously there are uh, costs attached to the travel as well. Um, but I will say um, it's very difficult to understand the scale of the financial flows between right-wing actors overseas and those that are based in the United States. This is a really hard problem. Um, and also it's a problem we shouldn't just think through the lens of money coming into the United States, but maybe money flowing out of the United States. And I think there was a really good piece um, written recently by a uh, terrorism financing expert by the name of uh, Jessica Davis, um, formerly of the Canadian government, where she documented that 60% of the funding of the truckers convoy um, that really gummed up the streets of Ottawa for months came from outside sources, not um, sources from within Canada. Inevitably, some of those sources um, very likely came from the United States. So there is like very little doubt in my mind that the extremist far right community is internet interconnected globally. Um, and as an example of that, there was a website um, called ironmarch.org, which was founded in 2011 and existed for about six years. And it was a forum in which the US far right engaged with overseas counterparts. And some research I've been doing at the center that I run at Middlebury, the Center on Terrorism, Extremism, and Counterterrorism, I and a few of my graduate research assistants have examined the contents of that website um, that have been published in the form of a SQL database. And we have access to this database. It's publicly available. In the review of our contents, there are absolutely exchanges related to financing, but they are actually somewhat limited. Um, what was more apparent in that database was how engaged the far right in the United States um, was with the far right uh, overseas in terms of amplifying each other's rhetoric um, and demonizing perceived enemies of the, the, the white race. And so um, there is this international connection. Um, again, understanding the financing and the scale of it is, is much more difficult. And I think it's difficult um, because uh, various reasons, some of which do relate to legal authorities um, that make it perhaps difficult for the United States to pursue things in the way that they could. Because it's an interconnected global community, um, I know I've advocated for more designations of right-wing groups based overseas, but if they are interconnected with US individuals, it does make it thornier for the US government to pursue designations even against a foreign-based group if there is a significant domestic presence, which can be broadly construed of, of, a, of a group. So as an example, um, you know, the Proud Boys uh, has chapters throughout the world, but obviously there is a Proud Boys group based in the United States. Um, because the Proud Boys have these other chapters, the interconnectedness between them um, could be difficult to designate, say, Proud Boys Canada or Proud Boys UK, um, because there is a Proud Boys US, because there could be an argument um, in reviewing the dossier of evidence that there is a significant domestic presence um, of the Proud Boys that would pre preclude the possibility of designating these domestic, these other groups based overseas that are Proud Boys connected. Um, and I will say, just generally speaking, um, other Five I countries, um, Canada, Australia, um, New Zealand, um, the United Kingdom, do have an easier time pursuing some of these kinds of actors than the United States for a lot of the reasons Mary had mentioned already related to um, the freedom of speech um, challenges. Um, so one thing I do think um, that can be done is more coordination between Five Eye partners in pursuing designations in tandem um, when possible. Um, and, and an example, Canada and United Kingdom have designated um, multiple organizations that may be difficult for the United States to pursue, but they have designated some that could be within the, the US government's capability to, to designate if there is uh, ample information sharing. So I, I do wonder if there is some space there, um, but I, I think we can't overlook the difficulty that exists in pursuing designations, even against overseas actors because of these connectivities that I mentioned um, before, some of which were very kind of um, stark um, in the context of the exchanges that we saw over the ironmarch.org um, website when it was uh, extant. Um, so uh, I, I'll pause there, um, Elko, but there's some of my thoughts as it relates to the international linkages um, and opportunities and difficulties that exist with pursuing uh, action in that space. 
Thanks, Jason. And I might uh, I might immediately pass it on to Mary because obviously uh, this is a core part of uh, has been and and continues to be a core part of of her work. I'm particularly curious to to hear a little bit more about this designation problem um, uh, and how um, uh, the more internationalized nature might actually make it more difficult uh, to investigate and prosecute uh, some of these uh, these activities domestically here in the in the U.S. Yeah, thanks, Elka. I just want to make sure, you know, to just start with the basics, right? There are just marked differences between the tools available to investigate the financing of domestic terrorism and those available to investigate international terrorism. And it's it's a these definitions are unusual in the US because um, one might think that domestic terrorism means anything that happens here domestically, regardless of the ideology that modifies it. But that's not the way the U.S. law treats domestic terrorism. A, and a terrorist act will be considered international terrorism under U.S. law, even if it occurs here in the United States, if there is a connection internationally. And what that typically means is a connection to a designated foreign terrorist organization. Um, it will be considered domestic terrorism if it occurs domestically here in the U.S., the territorial U.S., but has no connection to, you know, other international uh, terrorism, such as a foreign terrorist organization. And so the reason the U.S. law treats these differently, even though that Definition doesn't make a whole lot of sense, I think, um, intuitively, but the difference in terms of how we focus on domestic organizations is because of the First Amendment. It protects the freedom of speech and peace, peaceful assembly of U.S. persons and organizations, while, while the First Amendment protects no such protections, gives no such protections for foreign persons and organizations. Thus, U.S. law provides for the designation of foreign terrorist organizations like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, even if those same organizations might engage in some non-terrorist activity that would be protected by the First Amendment if they were based here in the U.S. And a foreign terrorist or FTO designation allows the U.S. to enforce criminal statutes that prohibit the providing any material support or resources to designated FTOs. Uh, the material support statute has been the most common terrorism charge brought by the U.S. You know, since 9-11, historically most common terrorist uh, charge, but is largely unavailable when it comes to domestic uh, organizations, support to domestic organizations. It provides for law enforcement and the intelligence community to open investigations on suspicion that a person or entity may be financing a foreign terrorist organization, regardless of the purpose of the financing. So in other words, even if a person wants to fund only the humanitarian operations of an FTO, it's prohibited. The material support statute drives U.S. financial services providers to implement implement sophisticated risk management protocols for detecting the potential misuse of their services for foreign terrorist financing. By contrast, because of the rights protected by the First Amendment, there's no comparable designation scheme for domestic extremist organizations. Hateful speech, even that that is abhorrent to the majority of the population, is protected by the First Amendment, as is assembling with others who share the same hateful views. So unless an organization engages solely in unprotected activity, such as committing crimes of violence, any designation of the organization, even if we had a regime that allowed for it, and right now we just don't have a statutory mechanism for it, even if one were created, um, it would any designation would probably run afoul of the First Amendment. Um, and that means law enforcement can't open an investigation based merely on a suspicion that someone is providing financing to an extremist organization. They instead have to base their uh, their organizations on, or their investigations on on reasonable uh, reason to believe that a crime is or may be being committed. So this brings us to some of the gaps, uh, other gaps that have been discussed in various forums and things that, in fact, Jason and I have written, co-written about, which is the gap in the U.S. terrorism laws. Um, right now, there is no generic domestic terrorism offense in the U.S. There are more than 50 terrorism offenses designated by federal law as ter terrorism offenses, but none of them apply to the most common type of domestic terrorism in the U.S. None of them apply to committing an attack with, it, with a firearm, uh, a mass attack, 
um, unless that that attack is is um, done on behalf of or in furtherance of the goals of a foreign terrorist organization. So if you think about the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando or the San Bernardino shooting out in California several years ago, those were done by people who pledged by it to, to ISIS right before the shooting. So that was considered international terrorism um, and it would be treated completely different than, this, for example, the shooter in El Paso who committed his attack without pledging by it to a foreign terrorist organization, instead, in, instead really pledging his white supremacist um, ideology and his anti-immigrant ideology. There's no terrorism statute that applies to the El Paso shooter's conduct. Um, and so that gap means that, you, you know, law enforcement, if they're going to investigate, they have to be looking for some other uh, crime to be able to base their investigation on. They cannot base it solely on First Amendment protected activity. So they need to be looking to, is somebody talking about committing a crime of violence? Are they massing an arsenal of weapons and maybe they're not, you know, uh, in, entitled to obtain firearms? Uh, maybe somebody is a felon or maybe somebody is otherwise disqualified under U.S. law from obtaining those weapons? Are they conspiring to commit an attack like the, the seditious conspiracy that's on trial in Washington, D.C. right now uh, against several members of the Oath Keepers for the attack on the U.S. Capitol? You know, what what can what or in case of some of the litigation that I've been involved in civ on the civil side, um, you could have local law enforcement looking into are there violations of state anti-militia laws or anti-paramilitary laws. These things would allow for opening investigations, but not just by, based on the idea that an organization or individual is espousing extremist views, uh, espousing, you know, potentially violence as an end to mean without anything more concrete um, than that. Um, I will say just a few points about a domestic terrorism statute. This is something that's been debated for a number of years. Occasionally there will be uh, bills that are introduced, especially after the El Paso shooting. It's a bill actually I consulted with various members of Congress on, um, but there's very strong opposition among the civil rights and civil unions civil liberties community, of which I consider myself one based on the litigation I now bring outside of government, but there is so much mistrust of law enforcement in the U.S. that many in the civil rights and civil liberties community are opposed to a statute that would give law enforcement any additional criminal tools because they fear that that statute would be misused against marginalized communities, people of color, and, and uh, groups who have been sort of historically oppressed by law enforcement in the US. That means, although you could create a statute that would be ideologically neutral, that would, could criminalize crimes of violence done with the intent to intimidate or coerce the civilian population, or influence the policy of government through intimidation or coercion, regardless of the ideology, Islamist extremism, white nationalist extremism, anti-government extremism, ecological extremism, regardless of the ideology, you could create such a crime. You could have that crime be part of uh, one of the predicate acts for material support to terrorism, not material support to a foreign terrorist organization, but material support to terrorism. And then you could get at things when people are stockpiling weapons, knowing and intending to use those weapons in a mass attack, a domestic terrorist attack. You could get at that kind of thing um, through a statute like that. You, this would bring a moral equivalency between the way we treat domestic terrorism and the way we treat international terrorism. It would provide for better record keeping. We have 100% perfect record keeping for uh, international terrorism investigations and prosecutions because they all go through the US Department of Justice. And it would allow for more studies to help Count, you know, develop countermeasures, but uh, the opposition is very great. And it's something that I don't see as surmountable in the near term, even with robust oversight, things like, which I have suggested, and Jason has also suggested, things like annual public transparent reporting about the number of investigations opened and into what type of ideological violence. We know from the FBI director that anti-government uh, and militia violent extremism and whites racially motivated extremism are the two greatest threats to the homeland right now. So how many cases are you opening into that? Are your cases, are your open investigations commensurate with what we know the threat to be? 
public reporting like that, um, maybe oversight by independent uh, bipartisan boards, such as the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, these kind of measures that could provide um, some oversight. But uh, even with those measures, there continues to be opposition. And I have not seen those uh, bills move in the US Congress since their introduction. Thank you, Mary. Um, Karen, you provided earlier some great examples of system change in, in the financial system that can support the uh, potential early identification of, of far-right activity. Uh, I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into what individual banks and other financial institutions can undertake beyond uh, systematic change, beyond regulatory actions, whilst of course ensuring um, access to the financial system, protecting bank customers' rights and satisfaction, uh, so curious for your reflections there, and of course, particularly curious to hear a little bit more about Amalgamated's uh, Hate is Not Charitable campaign, which would fit into this uh, this category. Sure. Um, you know, Hate is Not Charitable is fundamentally asking what can the philanthropic sector do, um, which includes banks that are managing charitable giving. Um, and so I'll just tell you a little bit about what the, what the campaign is and what our goals are. Um, Hate is Not Charitable was initially launched in 2019 after reporting showed that between 24 and 2017, donor advised funds, specifically with large commercial providers, had facilitated tens of millions of dollars in charitable donations to organizations um, uh, that are either anti-immigrant, xenophobic, racist, anti-LGBTQ, anti-democratic. Um, they basically started working with the list of, of hate groups from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, and the campaign was launched by Amalgamated Foundation, um, which was founded in 2017, with the very simple premise that the benefits of charitable giving, which in this case, um, donor advised funds, uh, the benefits are both tax incentives and anonymity, um, that these incentives were intended for the public good and that financial institutions can and we think should exercise discretion when facilitating the flow of dollars to groups working explicitly against the public good. Um, you know, Jason mentioned that the, the groups, the groups avoiding paying taxes um, by being nonprofits, we also just don't think their donors should benefit from, from tax incentives either. Um, you know, if you want to donate to the Proud Boys, I don't think that um, my family as taxpayers should be subsidizing that. Um, and so this is an area where um, we're not relying on groups being labeled terrorists. Um, we're not relying on, um, we, you know, we're not violating any free speech. This is about financial institutions making a values-based decision that they're allowed to make and for donors to then make an accompanying, accompanying decision about where they wanna put their money. Um, now, initially the launch of the campaign, um, Amalgamated Foundation circulated a sign-on, um, which they circulated primarily to foundations, um, large and small and donor networks and about 90 institutions signed on pretty quickly. Um, those 90 institutions signed, uh, signed on to a pledge that indicated that they would individually enact policies and procedures to make sure that they don't uh, wittingly or unwittingly make grants or facilitate uh, DAF, DAF pass-throughs to organizations on the list of hate groups um, or others uh, engaging in any of the, the targeting of groups that I mentioned a minute ago. And then the campaign kind of sat for a minute. Um, there, was, there was not staff. Uh, it was a very good idea with not a lot of dedicated resources. And then earlier this year, uh, the foundation raised the money to build out the campaign, to hire a campaign direct director, which is apparently me, um, and to expand on the earlier work and move some new work forward. Um, and that's where we are right now. So I came on in September. Um, I just joined uh, in September um, and we uh, built a campaign plan. And I'll tell you that looking ahead, the campaign has three goals, three main goals. Um, first, basically just to, I mean, it, ground floor to stem the flow of resources to organizations that promote hate. Um, also to increase transparency, create accountability and shift policy and practice on the funding of hate within the philanthropic sector. So we're really seeking to influence the philanthropic sector, which is everything from the foundations themselves to philanthropic advisors and to donor networks. Anyone who's making a decision about where, um, where you know, charitable giving can go should understand who the charities are that this giving is going to. And the third goal is to establish and activate a principle that donors committed to human rights and social justice should not entrust their resources to institutions that allow donors to promote hate. So if you are a donor who is aligned with human rights and social justice and your financial institution is, is channeling dollars to hate groups, you should know that um, and you should, you should move your money. 
So we will be organizing the philanthropic sector to adopt and promote standards. Um, and we'll also be organizing donors to leverage their assets to ask their financial institutions to adopt standards as well. Um, we're also working with partners in philanthropy and in movement work to develop a strong set of standards. Um, you know, the, a screen that can be used not just by financial and philanthropic institutions, but also by uh, in philanthropic advisors and donor networks to do education with their donors. Um, we really are pushing a lot of uh, awareness and transparency and education with the campaign. Um, I will say it's also important and a piece of what we're doing is building a pooled fund to support on the ground organizations responding to these groups every single day. Um, the fact is that those groups are often under resourced, um, especially as somebody who's coming from a background working in statewide advocacy, there's a lot of money flowing to national groups and not quite as much to those working on the state level, which is actually where a lot of support is needed. Um, and it also may not surprise you to know that some of the financial institutions who are channeling the most dollars to hate groups have the tougher screens um, to be able to support younger startup, Black-led organizations. Um, they may not see those organizations as a great investment for their donors while they're also passing through money to, to some of the very far-right groups. Um, and so we want to build a pooled fund to support that work on the ground. And finally, we're exploring um, regulatory options um, or regulatory opportunities. Um, currently, we've been working with the Minnesota, uh, the Minnesota Attorney General's office. Very happy to say he was reelected last night so that work can continue. Um, and we're hoping to organize some state attorneys general, um, state attorneys generals around um, around the idea of, of better regulating these groups as charities um, themselves and also providing consumer notifications about these groups, um, which is very much in the, in the purview of state attorneys general. Um, currently, we're in the middle of getting our research from 2019 updated, um, and we should have a freshly relaunched and expanded campaign in the beginning of the new year. I know you wanted me to mention what, what institutions can do. Um, we There will be another sign on coming in the beginning of the year. Um, and we're also planning a ton of educational opportunities. Um, and certainly you can reach out to me and we are happy to share the resources that we have if institutions are interested in pursuing their own screen or set of standards on their own in the meantime. Thanks so much, uh, so much Karen for providing, providing that example um, and really interesting to hear uh, the kind of uh, innovative ways in which uh, banks are, are positioning themselves in this discussion uh, beyond just strictly following um, regulatory uh, guidance. Um, we have about 10 minutes or so remaining, so I'm going to try and fire a couple of quick questions uh, to uh, the panelists that have come in uh, during our discussion in, in the Q&A, uh, hoping to wrap us up uh, in about 10 minutes or so. Maybe I'll turn to Mary first. Uh, one of our participants asked uh, on the basis of um, uh, some of your insights provided in the last um, uh, uh, response, um, if conspiracy laws here in the U.S. may have the same practical effect uh, as a proposed uh, domestic material support law uh, in relation to terrorism. And then a second question connected to that is uh, the effectiveness of state laws uh, versus, versus federal laws when it comes to um, terrorism, terrorism financing. Yes, thank you for that question. And I like the fact that the question honed in on conspiracy because we are talking about one thing that's very different about, you know, counterterrorism use of um, investigations and prosecutions is the goal is to prevent the attack, not to prosecute after the attack. I mean, after El Paso, you know, obviously the shooter is being charged with 23 counts of murder as well as uh, federal hate crimes. He's going to end up going to jail for the rest of his life. But uh, what we're we're trying to do is is prevent the attack to begin with. So conspiracy can sometimes be a tool, but oftentimes these attacks are committed by lone actors who are not in a conspiracy with anyone. There's no indication, for example, that the El Paso shooter was in a conspiracy with anyone. Um, and I can give you a concrete example as well of how potentially a domestic terrorism offense, a new offense, could have helped with prevention. So um, the uh, several years ago, a Coast Guard lieutenant, because he was using his Coast Guard computer, was uh, ha did have an attack thwarted. He was amassing an arsenal of assault-style rifles. 
he was also amassing um, a, a, a large quantity of methamphetamines so that he could, um, and he was planning a series of mass shootings. He was researching what the targets might be online, and he was planning this series of mass shootings in order to create a white ethno state. And he wanted to be able to take these methamphetamines, methamphetamines once he started his shooting spree so that he could stay up 24 seven and, and commit this shooting spree. Now, like I said, his plan was thwarted because he was using his government computer to do his planning. And so that was uh, found out by the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, but there was no terrorism offense to charge him with because he was planning shootings, um, et, and, et cetera. And none of the more than 50 offenses applied. So he was charged with um, possession of an unlawful silencer because of a silencer on one of the weapons, possession of um drugs and possession of a firearm by a drug by a drug uh, abuser. Um, now, he was prosecuted. He ultimately got a 13 year sentence. And so many people may say that's plenty. He doesn't need a longer sentence. But there's nothing about that prosecution that would even reflect what it was he was planning. And in fact, when the government first arrested him and sought to have him detained pending trial based on his dangerousness, the, the initial judge said, well, you haven't even charged him with a crime of violence. How could I possibly detain him on this? Now, they the government appealed that and, and the next judge agreed that he could be detained. But I think it shows sort of like the inadequacy of some of the tools that are available. And it was really kind of by luck that he was even found out. If you had a, a, a terrorism offense that applied across the board ideologically, and that was a predicate to the material support to terrorists, someone per, per potentially noticing these purchases of firearms um, could have started looking into what his uh, what his plans were. And, and um, you know, he was planning, he was hiding the nature of his resources, firearms, uh, knowing and intending to use those in this crime of domestic terrorism. But we didn't have that offense. So another lone actor, another place where a conspiracy would not have been sufficient. Other areas where you really do have a conspiracy, it could be a useful tool. I, I agree. On state anti-terrorism laws, um, there are domestic terrorism laws in about 25, 26 states, but really um, they're not that useful, and here's why. States just don't have the um, bandwidth and resources and capacity to be engaged in a lot of proactive prevention type investigations. State and local uh, law enforcement and district attorneys tend to be reactive. Murder happens, they investigate, they prosecute. Um, it takes a lot of resources, information, and intelligence to be doing proactive investigations in the prevention space. And that's not just in terrorism. Think about things like preventing child sexual ex exploitation or human trafficking. Right? These are things that you're trying to investigate beforehand so that you can prevent some of the ill effects. And that requires a lot of information that frankly, the federal government is better at obtaining because it is you know, operating across the country and it has it is better resources, it is a better ability to obtain information from multiple different sources. So for one thing, they just don't have the tools to really be active in that space. The other is once a homicide has happened, for example, if we're talking about murder or once a significant other type of assault has happened, um, for a prosecutor in a state, it's easier just to prove the murder or prove the assault than to prove that it was done with the intent to intimidate and coerce. And if they're going to get a life sentence on a murder, why make it harder for themselves to be proving an additional element of the offense, the specific intent to intimidate or coerce to get the same sentence. So they just don't tend to be used that often. Thanks so much, Mary, for those, uh, those responses. Um, Jason, uh, another uh, participant um, um, asked the following question. You know, we've of course seen that the dollar amount that is needed to undertake terrorist attacks is often quite, quite small, uh, leading to a lot of people to sell funds or just to receive small funds. Um, and this, this participant indicated that if, if the travel rule you referenced earlier only covers transactions below 3,000 US dollars, won't that miss most of the uh, micro donations, crypto or otherwise, that violent extremists are receiving? And how, more, how, in more general terms, are we trying to tackle this problem of you know, very small funds um, uh, going to these individuals um, uh, and their need for uh, the amount of funding uh, being, being quite limited to actually conduct uh, an attack? 
So it, it's a great question. And the, the premise is uh, absolutely right that uh, the cost of terrorists is generally uh, low. There are exceptions to that rule. The Al Qaeda 9-11 um, attack costs anywhere between $500,000 to $600,000. And in the $3,000 point, um, it will miss things. There's no question about that. Um, just as there are standards in which people are using the formal financial system that are at lower dollar value amounts that are also likely missed. So how, how do you close that gap as uh, you know, being part of a compliance section, whether in a, you know, a cryptocurrency exchange or um, in a financial institution? And it really gets to the, the, the point of being able to determine suspicious behavior and issuing suspicious transaction related reports, irrespective of the uh, dollar amount or the amount of crypto that's being um, exchanged. Um, because there could still be um, patterns that are observable um, related to problematic uh, exchanges. Um, it could be geographically based or something else that could point individuals to point, uh, pushing forward an STR that can end up in the hands of, of law enforcement that could still be useful in the context of these um, micro uh, exchanges. So that, that would be one thing. And a second thing, um, Elko, I know we're down to the last uh, few minutes here, is to ensure that um, customer due diligence, know your customer related standards that are uh, historically very mature within banks are also going to be um, uh, part of a crypto exchange's uh, guiding principles. And I, I think we're still a little ways from them getting to that point, like we see with banking institutions, but that is another way to deal this challenge of those law, uh, low crypto uh, amounts that the travel rule will not cover. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, last question. And this one I'm going to put uh, to, uh, to, to the full panel um, uh, as we are very, very close to, uh, to ending our, our session. You know, this discussion, Jason's paper, uh, we've really identified the needs as well as some of the obstacles and opportunities to prevent the financing of pirate uh, extremism. But at the same time, of course, unfortunately, we witness globally the abuse and the misuse of measures to combat terrorism financing, um, to debank and de-risk specific communities, using these types of measures as a justification to investigate and prosecute political opponents, to shrink civic space, and so my question to, to the three of you, and perhaps uh, starting with Mary, then turning to Karen, and then ending with Jason, is, is the following. You know, how can governments work closely together with the private sector and human rights uh, experts, uh, civil society organizations, financial inclusion experts, to make sure that the kind of legal and policy frameworks that, the, that we're developing to combat far-right extremist groups um, are risk-based, um, and account for some of these potential negative negative consequences. Mary, let me turn to you first. Yeah, I mean, your question really, you know, um, harkens back to what we've seen with respect to the debate over a domestic terrorism law, right? You know, abuses of the past are very much, and the present, are very much front of mind for people in this space, and they worry about any kind of tools that could be abused, and unfortunately, we can still, we still see tools being abused. I don't have any, you know, perfect solutions for this, but I, I think a couple of things would be useful. I mean, any kind of... Um, policy or legislation in this area, you know, has got to be done with a lot of substantial input, depending on uh, what we end up with in Congress once the vote counting gets done. I mean, normally I would say congressional hearings, right, to be to investigate and bring uh, voices in to testify about this would be one useful tool. I also think we could have um, uh, DOJ, DHS, and the Treasury Department convene a series of stakeholder meetings, uh, including with state AGs, as well as civil society, civil rights, to really talk, and the private sector, to talk about what is within the realm of the possible with appropriate safeguards against misuse. So those are a couple of thoughts I have for that area. Thank you, Mary. Turning it to you, Karen. Yeah, I'll just say briefly, I mean, I like I come at this as a community organizer. And so I believe in relationship before task. And so for me, that means that we are not developing a simple list of these are bad organizations. We are actually working with and relationally training people in philanthropy to have an understanding of why organizations are being labeled, um, what's at stake, because we want to make sure that that, like you mentioned, we do not want, for example, like Palestinian human rights organizations to be targeted with the same restrictions that we want to put on, say, you know, uh, like the Aryan Brotherhood. 
Um, and so for us, it's about really training the people and making sure that the people are very, the people who are facilitating these, these gifts are very much educated and very much involved. Thank you, Karen. Jason. So at the end of the paper, in the conclusion, we talk about the difficulty in trying to detect uh, activities associated with the, the Pittsburgh synagogue attack, um, the attack in Oslo, uh, attacks that Mary had mentioned in her very first intervention, and how some of those solutions you would potentially try to pursue to stop those attacks would be very Orwellian in, in orientation. And for me, um, that, that is a, a great concern. So thinking about the, the need to have these relationships, um, these meetings together where you have civil society and government together talking about these issues vis-a-vis, um, -vis, say, the application of sanctions as one example, I, I think is critically important. So I would echo both what Karen and Mary have said on that front. The second thing I would say is um, the Financial Action Task Force, multilateral bodies like the United Nations have, I think, a unique role to play to ensure that countries um, don't overstep the line in terms of how they apply pressure against uh, perceived enemies. And, and quite often they they have in the past uh, uh, made mistakes in this space. There, there is you know, very clear in the Special Rapporteur's report of the United Nations on, on human rights and how sanctions are applied that there are violations. So for me, I think it's really incumbent, for instance, as one example, the Financial Action Task Force, you know, every few years does mutual evaluation reviews of government's posture vis-a-vis -vis, um, the various recommendations that FATF has on the books related to terrorism financing and money laundering. Uh, I think they should have a standard set of questions that actually ask those regulators and law enforcement bodies about the ways in which they ensure human rights, privacy, civil liberties are um, enshrined in the context of trying to counter terrorism finance and criminal finance. Um, I think having those questions will put government entities specifically in, in a hot seat of sorts to actually have a credible response. And if there isn't, those mutual evaluation reports need to reflect that. Thank you, Jason. Uh, well, that brings us to a close of today's session. I would really like to thank everyone for their participation um, today. And of course, a specific thank you to our panelists, Jason, Mary, and Karen, uh, for sharing their expertise, their insights, and their time uh, with us this, this morning. I invite all of you to visit the Global Center's website, uh, download Jason's policy brief, and explore uh, the other work that we undertake in the space of anti-money laundering, countering the financing of terrorism. I look forward to further discussions and collaboration on this important topic with all of you. Have a wonderful rest of the day and thank you again for joining.